Praise the Lord. You know, um, let me just share a little bit about how everything went down. As you guys know, I was able to share my testimony. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't share uh, so I can glorify my life. I don't. Uh, you know, just uh, through this whole process of the movie, I had to revisit, you know, certain areas in my life where, where man, it's brought me to my tears. You know, it brought me to tears, you know, looking at pictures and, and, and pretty much with my wife and saying, man, that happened right around this time. And so it's been a hard journey, to be honest with you. Um, but what happened is I, I was able to share my, my testimony on this thing called Body Driven, as you guys know. And um, um, a producer saw it, and he pretty much just said, David, if you can come up with, I'll be honest, 100000 he said, I, would, uh, I can probably make this movie. And I was like, oh, yeah, all right. I'm from L.A., homie. I don't get no $100,000, man. <laughs> and it's like rob a bank or something, you know. And, um, but we prayed, and in a week, we raised it. You know, that's the Lord. Well, we didn't raise it. People donated. That's how it happened. But, but what happened is, is that now this is getting bigger than I thought. So, so now I, I know that, the, that one, of the, one of the main dudes, the directors, has gotten access to the AMC theaters in California. He's working at Texas, New Mexico, and other, other areas to play the movie. So I'm like, orale, this is crazy. And so they say, hey, Dave, if you guys can, um, you know, ask the body if they want to help, it would really help production. You know, um, if not, we're only going to have one car at every scene. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> so if you guys want to help, look, first of all, I want to say thank you. I know a lot of some of you guys came uh, for the casting. Um, um, if you haven't got a call back, it means you don't know how to act. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it just means that they already, uh, uh, they're still going to keep looking for people. And again, I'm, I don't have no control over that. They do. You know, uh, but, uh, but thank you guys who came out. And I do know that they're looking for a lot of extras. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, reach, reach out to me on social media or Vince Romo. And we'll get in contact with you as soon as possible. But filming starts next week. Uh, no, actually on the 13th, I believe. And, and there's going to be a, uh, a part where we're going to film here and in the small chapel. So praise the Lord. And you guys can be in the movie. But that's God's grace, man. It is, man, to be honest with you. And I'm just overwhelmed and, and humbled, you know, and, and, and I appreciate the prayers. As, as my brother said, the enemy has been attacking, of course. You know, uh, homeboys from, from my past calling us, threatening us, to drop the movie. And I'm like, calmate, you ain't going to drop nothing, you know. But you know something? But we're not doing it to glorify the gang life. We're doing it to, uh, to share what God did, you know. Um, but I will say uh, there will be no bad words. There'll be no sex scenes, yay, right? It'll be a clean movie, and there will be violence because that was part of my life, you know? And um, um, so hopefully the, the Lord reaches many with this movie. So praise God. But thank you for those who showed up. And like I said, if you want to help financially, prayer, that's important, number one. But if you want to help financially, just go, go on my, on my, I'll be posting it today, and you guys can help us. It would, it would help us to... Uh, you know, to get uh, uh, the things that we need. But other than that, let's get into the Word. Amen? Matthew chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. We're going to be looking up, uh, I entitled the message, The Unforgivable Sin. Now, let me share with you why I, I, I decided to speak on this topic. I was having a conversation with my daughter the other day, and she came up and asked me, Dad, what is the unpardonable sin? And I said, well, it's, you know, the sin that, that won't be forgiven, Right? So we just started conversing, and so it kind of like, I, I've looked into the topic uh, years ago, but I never really visit it. I, I do share it when, uh, when I give an altar call, and I say, you know what, I'm going to start, I wanna, I'm going to read into it. So I started studying, listening to different sermons and, and stuff like that, and I was really convinced this is a message that people need to hear today. Because you can cross the deadline and commit the unforgivable sin, which can cost you eternity. You hear me? But before I get into that, I do want to share this. Listen, God loves you. Jesus loves you so much. In fact, his love was demonstrated on the cross 2,000 years ago. And because I believe, and I hope that you do too, that we are living in the last days. And that one day we're going to be in the presence of our Lord. There's a lot of our loved ones, or maybe here today, that don't know Jesus. You know, So today I want to take that approach and encourage you guys... To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ if you haven't. And if you have, I'm going to encourage you and challenge you to get all fired up for the Lord. And let's make sure that when Jesus comes back, 
We're caught doing his will. And that is preaching the gospel because it is to the gospel message that people will get saved. Amen? So that's my intent today. So if you're in Matthew chapter 22, let, let's look at verse uh, 20, uh, Matthew 12, 22. I'll read the verses, we'll stop, and then we'll get right into the word. Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. It says, Then one, then one was brought to him, speaking of Jesus, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him. So that the blind and mute man both spoke and, and saw. And the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But notice this, Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, is he divided against himself? How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they, they, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless the first binds a strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Either in this age or in the age to come. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts clearly, Lord. We need to allow your Spirit, Lord, to get a hold of our hearts if we don't know you. And if we do know you, Lord, we ask that through this, this message, your word will, will pump us up, Lord. Get us on fire to preach this message that saves. Please, Lord, in Jesus' name we say, amen. I don't know about you, man, but I, I love messing with my, with my kids. I, I do. To this day, they're all adults, and I still love to mess with them. But when my daughter was five years old, you know, uh, she was in kindergarten. It, it, she went to Calvary Chapel Downey's Christian School, and, and they taught her the gospel for the first time. So she probably heard it and understood it for the first time at five. You know, and I picked her up from school, and she jumped on, and she was so excited. But is he thought, he died, he died. And I go, what's up? And she tells me, dad, dad, guess what? I go, what? She goes, you know, Jesus loves you. And my little evil heart said, she said, no, Daddy, he died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose again. And I'm thinking, <laughs> he goes, if you believe, Daddy, you'll go to heaven. I said, well, I don't want to believe. Huh? I said, I don't, I don't want to go to heaven, <laughs> Daddy. I said, I, I, I don't care about God. I'm, I, I was just testing her, messing with her. I had five years old. See, I'm mean. I'm mean. <laughs> and she started crying, Daddy, please give your life to Jesus. He'll save you. When I realized I went too far and, and Sonia was coming in, <laughs> I, had to, I had to change paths, right? I, I told her, Mom, I'm just joking with you, Mom. I love you, Mama. Man, but it blessed my heart that she shared the gospel for me. So she blessed me with little kisses. Oh, thank God you gave your life to Jesus, Daddy. She didn't realize I was a pastor. But anyways, <laughs> but she was right. She was right. We need Jesus in order to be saved. And one of the greatest scriptures that has ever been uh, g given to us by God was through the words of his son, Jesus. When he said in John 3, 16, listen closely, and we know this already, but let's think about it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I mean, we've quoted this verse so many times. We've seen it in, 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 in um, you know, billboards and in, in, in games and so forth. So we can grow numb to that verse, but don't ever forget that this is one of the most powerful verses in Scripture. And the reason why, because in it we see uh, God's greatest act, and that is that he sent his son his, uh, to, to show us how much he loves us, to go to a cross and to pay for our sins, that if we believe in him, we're going to have everlasting life. But if we don't, we're going to perish. That's important. 
Because I can tell you right now, there's a lot of people in this room that probably don't know God. And we're going to challenge you today. But isn't it a blessing to think of God's amazing, incredible, and indescribable grace and love that he would go to that extent in order that we might be saved, but more important to show us how much he loves us. God loves us. Don't ever forget that. The enemy is going to try to get you to doubt. The enemy is going to try to get you to question God's love. But please understand, he loves you. They should have a shirt that says God loves me, right? Because we need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded that God loves us, and regardless of what we do or what we've done, he's never going to kick us out of his family. That's why I love that song they were singing, right? We're a child of the living God, forgiven of all our sins, and destined to be in eternity with our God because of what Jesus did. So that's a blessing in itself. But as I mentioned, sadly, the reality is that not many people are going to experience God's grace and mercy and love because they will not surrender their hearts to the Lord. And there are some here today. There are some here today that play in church. There are some here today that I probably came because you were, you were invited. And I'm glad you're here and you're welcome here and we love you. You know? And I know you're probably saying, here you go, I'm talking about hell or money. right? Because we talked about the whole movie thing. Right? And you're probably already trying to build a reason why you shouldn't give your heart to God. But I'm going to explain to you something in this passage how Jesus warned about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I had you read in context, because I want you to understand why Jesus said this and who he was speaking to. He was speaking to a bunch of religious leaders. Guys that were so set in their traditions that they didn't realize that they were beginning in the way of what God wanted to do in the hearts of people. So the Lord speaks to them at the same time, trying to reach them. But So we're going to talk about that, but I do want you to understand that that God wants everyone to experience His grace and His mercy. But here's the other thing that we must understand. That those who haven't given their hearts to Christ, you have a deadline. And some of you are close to that deadline. Once that deadline is crossed, know that that you have committed the unforgivable sin or the unpardonable sin. And when this happens, listen, the person who commits the the unpardonable sin will die and end up in hell for all eternity. In fact, I want you to note that this sin can occur even before death, as one preacher noted. They will be just as bound and destined for hell in this life before they die with no chance of redemption, as if the gates of hell has already closed shut behind them. So the question is, what is the unpardonable sin? What is the sin that God will not forgive? Well, I want you to know that the unforgivable sin is not some kind of moral sin, which is like rape or murder. That's not what it is. In fact, I am so, those sins are forgivable. You know, my brother Johnny, he's, he's seven months er, uh, older than me because me and my brother are twins. We're born, you know, in seven months. So it's crazy. We're all born in the same year. But anyway, he's older and he thinks he's all that because he's seven months older. But Whatever. But my brother, at the age of 15, took another man's life, another youngster's life. And he got caught. And he ended up doing 26 years in prison. But it was in that prison where the Lord spoke to him. I remember when I got saved and we would have conversations on the phone. I would tell him about the Lord. And he finally, one day, he was in his cell. Someone walked in. They sliced his neck. And he was bleeding to death. And he cried out to God. And he said, Lord, if you save me, I'll serve you. Well, my brother survived. And now he loves the Lord. And actually, when he was in there, he he studied to become a theologian. So he's a theologian. But here's the thing. I am grateful that God forgives the sin of murder. And and he did his time. And trust me, he regrets it. It was dumb. He was young and dumb. (laughs) But I'll tell you this. By the grace of God, he is forgiven. He is forgiven and he's going to be in the presence of God because of the work that Jesus did. So I want you to understand that the the unforgivable sin is not rape or murder or, or any other immoral sin. In fact, I know those are wicked sins, but here's the thing. Those sins are forgivable, and those who have committed those type of sins can be saved and experience God's grace and mercy. Every sin that mankind has committed can be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? And then you have what is called the un... Uh, the, the, uh, I want you to also know, I'm sorry, that this unforgivable sin isn't actually an intellectual sin, meaning that an atheist or an agnostic or someone who just hates God... 
they too can be forgiven. In fact, I know a lot of people that were once atheists and, 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 and who now are believers. They, they, they responded to the message, and now they're serving God. So God can forgive someone who's an atheist, agnostic, or, what, or someone who just hates God. So the unforgivable sin isn't an intellectual sin. It's not even a verbal sin. That means if, if, if someone curses God to his face, God will forgive that person too. I was one of them. I remember when the gospel was presented to me, I didn't want to hear it. And I remember dissing the Lord and saying all kinds of bad stuff that I, now I look back and I go, I didn't realize what I was doing. But yet God forgave me. And he not only did he forgive me, he has a sense of humor. He put me in a pulpit. <laughs> so that's how God works. But listen, uh, I think about, about Peter. Remember Peter? The Bible says that, that when they confronted him, if he knew the Lord, he denied him and then he cursed. Remember that? And yet the Lord forgave him. This is one of the greatest sins ever committed in Scripture where he literally denied his Lord to his face. Yet he was forgiven. So it's not a verbal sin. In fact, know that God does forgive blasphemy against the Father. He, he forgives blasphemy even against the Son. I want you to know that someone can commit the unforgivable sin without even saying a word as well. You see, the word blasphemy, if you're taking notes, simply means to speak, un, uh, to speak hurtfully against, to speak impiously or irreverently of God. So someone can blaspheme God without saying a word. Just like you can pray without saying a word, you can blaspheme God without saying a word here. But I want you to know that, that the unforgivable sin, as we just read, is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You hear me? It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know that, this, that, that with this sin, there's an attachment to it. And that attachment is consequence. And we know that the ultimate consequence is hell, being separated from God for all eternity. But I want you to know that you get there through a process. And as we're going to see later on, the consequences is that God will send a strong delusion to the person who constantly rejects them. Like he gives them a little push to their decision. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. But looking at our story here in verses 22 to 32, I want you to know that the, that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God. In fact, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, as someone noted, is, quote, attributing to the devil the works of the Holy Spirit. Again, attributing to the devil the works of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening here as the Pharisees are, blaming, are saying that Jesus cast out the demon by the devil himself. So, listen. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a sin that can never be forgiven. It's a sin that one can commit knowingly, but also willingly. This sin can be committed with, quote, one's eyes wide open and then forever shut, unquote. I love what that preacher said about that. So let me give you the background now with that understanding. And then ask, have you committed this, the sin of unforgiveness? The, 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 the unpardonable sin? Well, we'll find out at the end of our message. But here's the story. Let's paint it now. As you're looking at the story, beginning in verse 22, when it says, then one who was brought to him, the, the, notice the word him there is referring to Jesus. There's this demon-possessed man who's blind and mute, and notice what Jesus did. He healed him. He healed him. Now, now not every demon-possessed person is, is mute or, or blind, okay? This one was. And he, they brought him to the Lord, and he touched him, and he was healed. Praise the Lord for that, because that's what the Lord does, right? After the miracle, we know, now notice what happens. The multitudes were amazed. They're, they're in awe. This, they, they've seen this person. They heard about this person. They're, they're a witness that this person was blind, that this person was mute. And, and now, they, now they're seeing them talk. They're seeing them see, and they're in awe. And notice their conclusion. Could this be the son of David? In other words, is this the Messiah? But at an earshot away... You have the religious leaders, the Pharisees of that day, who were very legalistic. And, they, and these we know, uh, based on the context and the Gospels, that they didn't like Jesus. In fact, they hated the Lord and his ministry. Now, we're told in verse 24, notice 
Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But notice verse 25, I'm sorry. It says this, And Jesus knew their thoughts. So that tells me, or this is the reason why one can blaspheme God in their mind. You hear me? You don't have to say it. It can be right here. So he knew their minds, just like he knows your thoughts right now. He knows whether you're saying, right? He knows exactly what you're thinking. Man, I hope he don't go over by now because the Dodger game is going to start in a few moments. He knows what's up. He knows your thoughts. He knows where you're at exactly when it comes to him. Well, these guys knew. They understood. They realized. I mean, they couldn't reject the fact uh, that, that, that Jesus just healed somebody. I mean, it happened right in front of their faces. But they realized that they were losing power and influence. They were losing power and influence, so they had to do something. As I mentioned, they couldn't deny the fact that Jesus supernaturally, miraculously, and wonderfully healed this man. So what do they do? They come up with something to try to persuade the people not to follow him. So, seeing that they were losing power and influence, and how it was being directed towards the Lord, what do they do? They, they pretty much said that he was doing this miracle by Beelzebub, who is Satan. I want you to know that this was the most diabolical, wicked, dirty, and hateful thing that they could possibly have said of Christ. Now, Beelzebub was a Phoenician god. The Phoenicians were pretty much a traveling people who were very superstitious. Uh, This was a god of filth and decay. And they're attributing this work that Jesus was being, that did through the Spirit of God. That's why he said in verse, uh, uh, um, the Holy Spirit is mentioned there in verse 25 uh, um, and so forth. So, so the work that they were that should have been attributed to the Holy Spirit, they attributed to the enemy. And in that context is where Jesus talks about the unforgivable sin. Think about that for me for a moment. The Pharisees then had the audacity to say that Jesus was casting out devils by this God of filth. This is when Jesus gave his teaching to show them the wickedness of their sin and how great their sin was. So it's noted that a threefold sin was committed, or like a threefold sin was committed here. You see, the Pharisees, without knowing what they did, is sin against redemption. They sin against redemption. You see, you need to understand that Jesus, let's get into the story, was working against the devil here. As he took this demon-possessed man, and he delivered him by killing him. He healed him, not killed him, he healed him, <laughs> right? He gave him his sight back, and he gave him his, his, uh, his, his voice back. So he was working not for the devil, but against the devil. What you see here is redeeming love in action as the Lord was ministering to this man. But I want you to know that the same hands that blessed the demon-possessed man would have no doubt blessed even these religious leaders if they were just receive him and trust him. You see, the same love that delivered the man would have delivered them as well. Because in Luke 19, 18, we're told that Jesus came for that purpose. To deliver and to save all men. But the Pharisees sinned against our Redeemer and therefore against this redeeming love. Now, these were the same ones. And don't forget that if you continue reading in context, that these Pharisees were the same ones that slapped Jesus in the, fla- in the face. They were the same ones who, who pulled the Lord's beard off his face. They were the same ones who cried out, you know, for his blood and then aid the, 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 the Romans in, the, in crucifying the Messiah. And you can read about that in Matthew 26 all the way down to Matthew chapter 27. Now listen. I want you to know that if you don't give your heart to the Lord, know that you're sinning against redemption. Against the one who loves you. In fact, the one who adores you and who wants to save you. But when you reject him, what you're doing is trampling beneath your feet the precious blood of the Lamb of God. You are crucifying Christ afresh. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is, notice that the Pharisees here were sinning against what we say is reason. Because in verses 24 to 26, I want you to note that they knew better. They knew better in the sense that what they were saying didn't make sense. Come on. Bells about the devil casting out the devil? Come on, man. You're not, you're not, you're not making sense. So it was common sense, right? 
Common sense would have tell them that this wasn't true because a house divided against itself cannot stand. So how can Satan cast out Satan? Now, thing is that if somebody is working for the devil, the devil never wants to deliver anyone. He wants to bring people into bondage, doesn't he? The devil never wants to bring peace and joy. He wants to bring misery and pain. In fact, Jesus talked about in John 10.10 when he described the enemy as a thief who does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his purpose. So how can Jesus cast out a demon or Satan through with Satan? It doesn't make sense. But in their mind, you know what they're doing? They're crucifying reason to crucify Christ. That's exactly what is taking place. They're crucifying reason to crucify the Lord. And there's some here today that will crucify reason so that they can have it their own way, live their own way, follow their own ways of understanding. How many have said, tell me if this is not true, that they don't come to church because there are so many, they reason in their mind, hypocrites in the body of Christ. Right? Well, I don't want to go to church because there's so many. And we know that that's not true. Well, I hope not. I hope not. But we know that there's not a lot. Of, I, I'm sure that 100% of people here are all good Christians, right? I hope so. I'm praying that we're not living hypocritical lives, that we're not the means why people, uh, why we're not the means of their excuse for not coming to the, to the Lord. I pray that you guys are living so lives that are so honoring to God, so pleasing to God, that you're a conviction rather than a stumbling block in their lives. Amen? So, so, so here's the thing. They reason in a way that they know it's not fair, that it's not right. Just like those that reason that there's too many hypocrites in the church. That's why they don't come. So, knowing they sin against redemption and they sin against reason. But that's not the unforgivable sin just yet. What, what that is, 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 is setting up the stage for the unforgivable sin which is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now notice another thing I want you to note here. That the Pharisees sinned against the revelation that was shown to them. And here is where the problem was. And this is why Jesus warned them, you see. You see, in verse 28, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit worked through Jesus. You hear me? He worked through Jesus, and then he bore witness through that work that Jesus was the Son of God. See, the, the, the Pharisees' battle or struggle was not against Jesus, but the Holy Spirit. They were rejecting the one who would enlighten them to the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. Are you guys following me? I'm trying to go slow. <laughs> so, who they rejected was the one who would g- give them understanding and to the fact that Jesus was the Son of God the, that, that came from the line of David. So, many can blaspheme the Father, right? And say that there isn't a God. Or you can blaspheme Jesus by saying that he's just a prophet or just a, you know, a fictitious person. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he destroys all those ideas and he gives you Enlightenment, he enlightens you to the fact that Jesus is not just a prophet, just not the good teacher, not just not a historical figure, but that he is the Son of God. And when you respond in faith, that is the moment that the Holy Spirit then comes and takes residence in your life, which is your guarantee for eternal life. You guys following me? No? Okay, but let's go home. No, I'm just okay. So I just want you to follow because I want you to understand because when your daughter or your friends or your sons or whoever comes and asks you, what is a forgivable sin? You got something to answer. Amen? So, so again, they were, they were, the Holy Spirit is the one who pulls away the veil of darkness. And then he's the one that opens the eyes of the Spirit so that people can understand. So the Pharisees sin against what is called the light that the Spirit of God shone on them in regards to the work of God. They sinned against that light. When, when Jesus was on the cross, if you remember with me, he could say of those who were crucifying, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. But when the Pharisees, what the Pharisees did, they knew exactly what they were doing. So they were sinning against the light. They were sinning against the Holy Spirit, rejecting the Holy Spirit. See, 
The Father has a ministry, which to rule is to rule the universe. The Son's ministry is to save man, and he works together with the Father. But the Spirit's ministry is to convict the world of sin, to open their eyes and to give light to man so that they can understand and then respond to the saving message of the gospel. But when someone's, and here's the thing that I want you to understand, that when someone stands before God to be judged, they're going to be judged, listen closely, by the light that they rejected and not the sin that they committed. The light that they rejected. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, just look at verses 23 and 24, just in the next page there. In Matthew 11, verse 23, we read this. And you, Jesus is speaking, Capernaum, where Jesus did his ministry, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For, for if the mighty works which were done in you, Capernaum, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Well, why does Jesus say that? Well, because Jesus did a lot of ministry in Capernaum. And Sodom was the most, we know it was the most wicked cities or morally wicked city on earth. But at the judgment, it's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom than it will be for in Capernaum. Because Capernaum had the light, had Jesus preaching and ministering and healing so he's saying, listen, it's going to be worse for you because you rejected that light. John chapter 1, right? It talks about that Jesus is the light that gives light to all men. And in John 3.19, Jesus tells us what the judgment is. He says, and this is the condemnation, 3.19, John 3.19, that, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So the Pharisees were sinning against the light. And in doing so, they were attributing to the devil the work that the Spirit was doing through Jesus Christ as he gave bare witness or bare testimony to him being the truth. But so, so with that in mind, I said earlier that there are consequences that are attached to this type of sin. And I want to talk about that right now. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, I've been teaching 1 Thessalonians at our church and it's been a blessing, man, to be honest with you. I love Thessalonians, man. And I got to visit Thess uh, Thessalonica uh, uh, a couple years ago. And, and, and man, just to go and, and see the churches that, that Paul planted and minister to them, it was really a blessing, man. I, we're going again this year. I, I, I know some of you guys are going in, uh, in this church. And if you guys want to go with us, hey, hey just, just, venga, sit, vamos. But anyways, but the point is this. Paul is addressing... The church of Thessalonica, it was a young church that was on fire for God. He was not only the, past, the evangelist, but he was the pastor to the church. And he began to minister to them and began to speak to them regarding their faithfulness to the Lord in, in, in the first four chapters of 1 Thessalonians. And he's just kind of just in awe of how faithful they've been and, and in the sense that they received the little that they did in those four Sabbaths that Paul was there. And they began to implement it. And now they're being persecuted. So he writes to encourage them and all that. It's a really cool book. But in 2 Thessalonians, his second, his second letter to the Thessalonica, uh, the, the church in Thessalonica, in chapter 2, we have two of the most terrifying verses in all Scripture. And the reason why I say that is because of what it says. Let, let's read it. Notice what it says in verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie. Ooh. I want you to think about that for a moment. Not the devil, because the devil does send delusions, right? But God. Does God send strong delusions? Yes, he does. Well, to who? Well, let's keep on reading. For what purpose? To believe the lie. Verse 12. Here's the purpose, that they may be condemned who do not believe the truth. So the people who didn't believe in the truth, God was saying a strong delusion. Yes, why? Because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, listen closely. God sends his delusion so they can believe the lie because they didn't want the truth. They prefer their sins. So God says, you want your sin? Fine. See, you can't have sin and truth. You got to make a choice. You know, and, and I'll share a little bit more about that. But I want you to know that sin has the power to deceive. You hear me? Sin has the power to deceive. 
When someone commits to sin, the person opens himself up to deception. Sin has this deceiving power, and we need to understand that. And when someone denies the truth for, the, for unrighteousness, God sends a delusion so they can believe a lie. They wanted their sin over the truth. It's not that they didn't hear the truth, it's they didn't believe in the truth. So the Lord does what? Sends a strong delusion. Let me give you an example. So you're sitting here today, and you're listening to his message. And right off the bat, when John Mata came over here and said, if you guys want to help financially, some of you guys are probably oh, they're going to ask me for money. They always ask for money. And then I come up and, hey, God loves you in hell. And there he goes talking about hell. That's all they talk about is money and hell. You go home with your spouse. You sit down, you turn on the TV, and you're just trying to see what's on. You're, you know, channel surfing, right? And you're upset. You're mad. You wasted the first morning, the beginning day of your life, the morning, by going to church and hearing another hell message and money-asking message. And you're like, man, I'm tired of all this stuff. So while you're sitting there, and you're tarantarans, right? <laughs> Watching TV. You hear a knock. You get up, open the door. Who do you think it is? Hi. We are the Jehovah's Witnesses. And we want to tell you that there's no such thing as hell. And you're like, say what? You don't believe in hell? No, we don't believe in hell. In fact, we believe that once you die, you just stay there in the ground until the resurrection. Only 144,000 will be making, and you're not part of it, so we, we don't have much to offer. They're not going to tell you all that because they're a bunch of liars. But anyways... But you love the fact that there is no hell. So what do you do? I can follow this religion. And now you're going. And now you're part of it. And now you're deceived. Did God do that? Well, if you rejected his truth for unrighteousness, for your sin, yes. God will send a strong delusion that you should believe the lie. God will say, you don't want me. Here, I'll give you a boost to your decision. So you can commit that sin now and take that decision into eternity where you will never be able to experience the grace and the mercy of God ever again. That chance, that opportunity is taken from you. So it's important that you listen, that you respond to the message because the more you say no, the harder it will be for you to say yes. You can cross that deadline that can come with a great cost, your eternity. You're so in hell. So we read that they had pleasure in unrighteousness. This was the reason why God sent the strong delusion. As noted, you can't have the sin and have God's truth at the same time. You have to choose one or the other. When anyone chooses sin over truth, that's when <laughs> that's, they, they get what they want, that strong delusion. And this is part of the righteous judgment of God. Such individuals sin against, as I mentioned, revelation against the light. And when this happens, there is this deceiving power of sin. That's why Paul writes in Romans 11.8, Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of support, eyes that they could not see, ears that they should not hear, to this very day. You see the reason why God gave the warning? Jesus gave the warning? You can cross that deadline and then come get to the point of no return. So when, this, when someone commits this sin, something actually dies within them. See, with sin comes death. With sin comes death. I read this story. Let me read it to you. It's about a preacher, a preacher in Arkansas. His name was Joel Henry Hankins. I, I, I heard it, and I felt, man, this is a pretty good story, so I'm going to share it with you guys. <laughs> it's a true story about a young man who couldn't accept Jesus at his deathbed. But check this out. This is interesting. This is what he says. I was preaching in a service, and I, and I tore my heart out, preaching the gospel of Christ. I, I therefore gave an invitation, and, and God's spirit was moving. I mean, I saw a young man sitting up in the balcony, and I can tell that, that he was under great conviction. He was gripping, you know, the pew with one hand and holding the hymn on the, with the other. 
And so as others were coming down, I just tried to catch his eye. And, and, and I said, young man, you come to Jesus. It looked like he was going to, to step out. But then he stepped back and started singing again. Another sang was sung, and another song was sang, I'm sorry. And he said, young man, come to the Lord. But the young man closed his hymnal and, and turned and started moving. I said, thank God, hallelujah, he is coming to receive you, my God. He's coming. But rather than coming down the aisle, he turned and went out the back door and, was out and left the church service. Days later, the preacher was called to this young man's bedside because the man had been diagnosed with a disease that he didn't know that he had when, when he went to the service. A doctor said, you know, he's dying. The preacher went to see him. He said, son, have they told you the nature of your sickness? He said, yes, preacher. You don't have to be delicate about it. I know I'm dying. Well, son, the preacher says, I want, I want to ask you a question. Were you in the service on th such a date? Uh, yes, preacher, I, I was. Well, I was watching you, son. And it seemed to me that during the invitation, you were under conviction that, that, that you felt the need of Jesus in your life. Is that right? He said, preacher, when you were preaching and gave that invitation, I wanted to go down there where you were so badly. I, I felt I could jump over the balcony rail to come down to, to where you were. Well, son, why didn't you come? The preacher said he felt chills come over him. But he, I'm sorry, he said, every time that I started out, listen to this, I remembered my favorite sin. And I wrestled and I made up my mind that I wanted my sin. The preacher said he felt chills go over him, and, he's, and he tried to reason with the young man. He said, but now, if, if, you're, if you're to die, you can't have that, you can't have that sin anyway. Don't you, think, don't you think it's better if you give your life to Jesus? That young man looked at me, the preacher says, and he said, sir, sir preacher, you don't understand. When I closed my hymnal and willingly and deliberately walked out of the service, Something died within me. I can't, I can't believe. He said, son, God will save you. He wants to save you. He said, no, I'm telling you. I can't do it. Something died within me. The preacher said he wept and prayed and cried for that boy until he died without Jesus and slipped right into hell. That is what happens when we choose sin over God's truths. Are you guys hearing me? That's important. Because you don't understand that the more you say, the more you say no, the harder it's going to be for you to say yes. Every time that you hear the gospel and you turn away from it, you, you, it, it it's like you're dying it down. I remember when I first heard the gospel, it tugged at my heart. I remember, at nine years old, I remember I walked forward but I, it didn't follow through, you know. But, but I walked forward because it was such a powerful message. But through the years, people will come and share the gospel. And I remember saying, yes, uh, the second time, oh, man, that was powerful. That's crazy. You know, yes, but not right now. And then again, hey, bro, Jesus loves you. Oh, yes, I know, I know. Respect, respect, I said. And then again, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then again, oh, man, here we go again. Here comes the Jesus freaks. And when you least suspect, I mean, those Christians, and I would take off. What I was doing is I was slowly but surely developing that hardened heart for the things of God. And maybe right now you're at that point. You're close to that deadline. And you're listening to this message. And there's a tug in your heart. It's because God is trying to reach out to you and telling you, listen, you're going to cross that deadline. And once you cross that deadline, there's no turning back. God will send a strong delusion upon you that you shall believe the lie. You will believe the lie. The purpose for condemnation. You don't play with God. We don't play with God. Amen. We cannot play with God in our lives. That's why if the Spirit of God is speaking to you in the book of Hebrews, we read in chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. In other words, if you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, trying to tell you, listen, what David is saying is true, he expects you to respond because if not, God will respond. When? I don't know. 
I don't know if this will be the last message you hear before you hit eternity. But I'm here to tell you that God loves you. And that he wants to save you. And that Jesus is the only means for God to save mankind through the cross there in Calvary 2,000 plus years ago. So if you're sitting here and you're witnessing other people's lives being blessed, you, you see around and you see many saved already. But if you're not feeling anything in your heart, it might just be that it's already started to get hard. And I'm here to wake you up, man. To beg you, to plead with you, give your heart to Jesus Christ before it's too late. So, there's this power that sin has that brings forth death. Which leads to the damning power of this sin. That's when sin puts you beyond the reach of redemption. In Hebrews chapter 6, turn your Bibles there. In verse 4. Notice what it says. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4. It says, Hebrews 4, 6, 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Remember we talked about that? But first, before I get any further than that, when God says it's impossible, it's impossible. You hear me? You don't, don't, don't say, oh, well, well, maybe, well, I can, you know, just maybe. You don't know. You know, when my brother got shot, he got shot multiple times. One time he got shot up with a 45. And he told me when he was in the, in the car, as they were taken to the hospital, he couldn't even pray. The second time he got shot, I said, bro, you can't run. Tough. You, you, you're not that slick enough, bro. You got to stop gangbanging already, man. He survived. But I remember he said that the doctor was witnessing to him. On the way over there, all he can think about is, oh, man, I can't believe I got shot. He said, I didn't even think about God. He's a, he's a, a man who, who's, who's, who's a recipient of the grace of God because now he serves the Lord and he's walking with the Lord. But can you, some of us say, you know what, I'll just wait to my deathbed. What if you never get that opportunity? Oh, man. So he says, listen, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted this heavenly gift and notice have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. If you taste it, you didn't digest it. God's word. You just tasted it. You, you heard about it and it felt good and it was something that, man, this is, this is crazy that God will love me and that he died for me and he will put me in a righteous standing before God. This, you taste it. You, you feel it. You see it around you. But you don't surrender. It says you can put yourselves beyond the reach of God's redeeming love. Church, we can come to a place where it's impossible for us to be saved because with eyes wide open, we, can crucif we, we have crucified Jesus afresh. Some who nailed Jesus to the cross, as I mentioned, didn't know what they were doing. But when we reject Jesus and know that we're fully aware of what we're doing, and therefore we commit a greater sin than those who nailed them to that cross. This is what happens if a person has partake of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the good word of God and falls away, or they turn their back on the Lord. It's impossible to renew them to repentance. No one can be saved unless the Holy Spirit opens their eyes. But when someone says no to God's Spirit, he puts out his own eyes. In Genesis 6, 3, it says that God's Spirit will not strive with man forever. There can be a time where he says no more. That's why it's one of the most scariest verses in the Bible. Now let me share this as I close. If there's just a little desire, 
in your heart to come to Christ, respond to it. Why? Because if you don't, God will send a strong delusion. When? I don't know. If you think you've committed the unforgivable sin, but you still have the little desire to come to Jesus, then I'm here to tell you you haven't committed it. You can come to him now, and he will take you in with open arms like this. If Jesus were to come back last week, if you haven't given your heart today, today, you would have been already losing your head because the seven-year tribulation period has just begun. And there's no guarantee you're going to survive the seven-year tribulation or that you'll be saved in the seven-year tribulation period. And when you read a Second Thessalonians in context, it's talking about that time with Antichrist. So here's my thing to you now. God wants to forgive your sins, present, past, present, and future. But the only way you can do it is to accept him. Don't worry about changing your life. He changes your life. Trust me, I know what I'm saying, and many of you guys can agree with me, right? It was God's spirit that changed us. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord. 19 years old. I'm only 21 now, and I can tell you this. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm the big 5 old now. I'm 50. Can you believe that? Jeez. And I can tell you this, that was the best decision I ever made. <laughs> because God took me in, forgave me of all my sin, and gave me purpose. I can only imagine what he can do for you. So don't be a fool. In Proverbs 29, and I, I know I said I was going to close, but I, I got to give you this verse. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He who is often rebuked and hardened his neck will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. You've been warned. Don't keep rejecting Jesus. This might be the last rejection that you do. You might leave this place undecided. Well, to be undecided is to be decided. Because you don't know if death awaits you after you walk out through those doors. But it is appointed for every man to die once, then judgment. You're going to die. And you're going to face your creator. Either immediately, for the Bible says to be absent from the bodies who are present with the Lord, or the day on the great white throne judgment day. When you'll be pouring out your heart, God, have mercy, forgive me. And God will say, I can. You made your choice. Not my will, but your will be done.